Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 98 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a terrific discussion with Jessica Leahy for this episode. And Jess is the uh, best-selling, she's a best-selling parenting author, and her first book is called The Gift of Failure. And today we actually focused on her second book, which just came out this week, and it's called The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence. And this is such an important topic, so I'm so glad she was willing to come on the show and speak with us. And this is one of those general parenting topics that's not grief-specific, although one of the things we do talk about is how um, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, come into play here. And it turns out that the death of a parent or a primary caregiver is uh, considered an adverse childhood experience. So some of our kids have some increased risk factors there. Um, I think that with the, well, with the the rising rates of teen mental health issues that we were seeing even before the pandemic, and then with how much more difficult things have gotten over the past year, um, I think this is a really important and timely topic to be to be talking about right now. So I hope you will take a look at her book and read it. It's very well researched. Uh, But it's not a dry academic book. She weaves in stories from her own life, stories of real teens and the challenges that they face, um, along with, you know, interviewing experts and information and data and best practices and so forth. Um, So lots of great points that she makes throughout our discussion, some things to to listen for. You know, she talks about how genetics and epigenetics and environment work together to affect a person's risk of substance abuse. She talks about balancing risk factors against protective factors, and that's kind of what it comes down to when we're talking about risk reduction, and talks about some strategies and approaches for that, and goes into even more detail in the book about that. Um, and be sure to listen to listen for at the very end why her bottom line message for parents is delay, delay, delay. Uh, the more you can delay kids starting substance use, the more it decreases their eventual risk of developing substance abuse issues. So I hope you enjoy my discussion with Jessica Leahy. Today's episode is brought to you by my very own book. It's called Future Widow, Losing My Husband, Saving My Family, Finding My Voice. And it's a memoir, and you can find out all about it at futurewidowbook.com. That's futurewidowbook.com. And there you can find the links to buy it everywhere books are sold. And look for the button that says buy the ebook directly from the author, and you can save 15%. Just use the special code LISTENER15, that's LISTENER15, and go to futurewidowbook.com. I hope you check it out, and I hope you love it. My guest today is Jessica Leahy. Jess is a teacher, writer, and mom. Over 20 years, she's taught every grade from 6th to 12th in both public and private schools. She writes about education, parenting, and child welfare for The Atlantic, Vermont Public Radio, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, and is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. She is also the author of The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence, which has just come out and is available now. She's joining us today from her home in Vermont. Jess, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, I've really been looking forward to speaking with you today. And I think this is going to be a terrific addition to the series that I'm doing on parenting topics that are not grief specific. Um, Because Mm -hmm. as widowed parents, we, of course, have have the grief end of things. And we also have many of the same concerns and struggles that all parents have. Um, Mm -hmm. So this is really going to be great. And I encourage listeners to check out the other episodes in the series. I know that you know some of my prior guests quite well. Um, KJ Delantonia, of course, is your co-host mm-hmm. on the Hashtag Am Writing podcast, which is terrific for all the writers out there. Definitely listen to that one. I've gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of good tips and inspiration from your interviews there. Uh, and Julie lithcott Hames and Dr. Lisa Demore, who are all also best-selling parenting authors and speakers, um, And speaking of Julie, I wanted to actually start by sharing with listeners what she had to say about your latest book, The Addiction Inoculation. She said, quote, compelling, compassionate, and comprehensive, 
This is the definitive how-to on a topic that we ignore at our peril. The definitive how-to on a topic we ignore at our peril. I just thought that was really, really hits the nail on the head why we're talking about this today and why this is so important. Um, so thank you. Let's just jump Julie, right in here. Julie really puts things out there. She's not afraid to say it straight out. I love That's one of the yeah. things I love about Julie. Yeah, for sure. And she, of course, is the best-selling author of How to Raise an Adult and now uh, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, also out now. So... Um, lots of great resources here for people. Anyway, um, let's just jump right in. Why did you decide to write this book and who is it for? So this book, uh, all of everything I write pretty much, I hate to say this is for me. I mean, I have the best job in the whole world. You know, I get to get curious about something and then I'm a complete research dork. I love, love, love the research. So I dive in, I go really, really deep, go way too deep, frankly. And then I... <laughs> overwrite about the topic. I write like a book that's about twice as long as it needs to be and then cut it back and translate that stuff, that research for a popular audience. And so over and over again, when I get asked, you know, what, where do you get your ideas about how, what to write about? I, it's frankly, it's just the things that I'm curious about and the letters that I get from people about things they're curious about. So this book, um, the, the addiction inoculation really came out of the fact that Post gift to failure, I didn't really know what the next book would be. I had also gotten sober myself when right after I sold gift of failure, um, my dad pulled an intervention on me and I got sober. And so I now have a little over seven years, uh, seven and a half years of sobriety. But and then started working when I, when I had about one year of sobriety, I started uh, teaching at a drug and alcohol rehab for adolescents. And I did that for five years. So there was this sort of, I was curious about when the experts say, quote, substance abuse is preventable, what that means on a very granular level, what it means to me as a parent of two kids who came out of the womb, you know, with a, a big chunk of their risk sort of already in place because genetics is about 50 or 60% of the risk there. And then what does that mean for me as a parent of kids who have that genetic increased genetic risk? What does that mean for me as the teacher of kids who ha already have issues with substance abuse and where does that come from? And what do I need to be thinking about as a trauma informed teacher, that kind of thing. Um, so there were, I was coming at it from a lot of angles. And for me, this book is for any parent, coach, pastor, uh, teacher who's looking to do whatever they can to prevent substance use in, and abuse in kids. And so that's why there's an entire chapter in there for schools and for educators. Um, essentially, we all have a role to play. And I think as as people who care for kids and teach kids, I think it's really important to have put to show sort of a unified front on our approach. And so there's a lot more that we could be doing. And I just wanted to put that out there for people so that we can change the way we're doing substance abuse prevention in, at home and at school. Mm, yeah, terrific. Okay. And I love that you said um, that you really spent a lot of time researching this. And I think I saw a picture on social media at one point where you had stacks and stacks of books <laughs> around you. And I, all I love notes. it. <laughs> well, and I mean, to give you an idea for what's so interesting about process of writing for me is, um, you know, before you can sell a book, a nonfiction book, you have to write a proposal. And the when I had the idea for this book, I was like, okay, well, I've got a lot of researching to do before I can even write the proposal. So it took an entire year for me to write the proposal for the book mm. because you have to have enough of a grounding in the research to understand the landscape. And then a lot more research comes after, obviously. But in order to write the proposal and know what the shape of the book is going to be, you have to be fairly, you have to have done a fairly deep dive into the research. And, and I just really enjoy that part of it. I love, you know, connecting ideas from one um, genre to another, from one idea to another, from one sort of school of thought to another. And substance abuse is a really... Um, uh, there's a lot, it's a minefield because there are a lot of schools of thought. There's the, you know, uh, substance abuse is a brain disease. There's the, it's a developmental disorder. There's the, it's a trauma, uh, it's trauma based on trauma that you have. So, and the cool thing about it is that it, all of those things are true. <laughs> there is no <laughs> one place where we can say, no, all of you are wrong. And this is the only right answer. And so in order to from that to the language we use to describe these things is, is really important to talk about the gray areas and all the fun for me is in the gray areas, frankly. Mm, mm, yeah. 
Well, and as you said that, I thought, okay, so the the less cool thing about that is that it makes it so much more complicated and therefore harder to figure out, like, well, what do we yeah. do, right? <laughs> right, right. And so I admit, and, you know, this book, it turns out I had no idea this book was going to be as memoir heavy as it is. It just mm. turned out that way. And I'm, you know, there are my stories in there, as well as the story of two other young adults who were really just laid it out all, all out on the line, used their real names and everything. And there was a lot of storytelling to do here, which I think is one, all of my favorite nonfiction tends to be right at that intersection of memoir and nonfiction where it's, you know, it's data based in stories because that's how we as a culture tend to, you know, convey information best, I think is through storytelling. And so for me, it was a really happy sort of nexus between those two genres that I love so much. And, uh, and I hope that that approach makes the data more accessible because yeah. it's all grounded within real life stories and anecdotes and people. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, because if anybody is listening and thinking, wow, this is really well researched, it must be a dry scientific tome. It is definitely not that. It is very <laughs> readable, accessible, you know, as you say, the the messages come through the stories as well as the facts. So, um, so cool. Okay. Um, there's a few things that jumped out at me as I was reading it. Um, at one point, you mentioned that substance abuse is passed down to children through a combination of genetics, epigenetics, and environment. So mm -hmm. first of all, what is epigenetics? <laughs> um, and then how do these three factors kind of interplay and right. why is this really important to understand? So starting with genetics, because that's sort of the easiest to get, that's, you know, just what's passed down in our genes. And that it seems to, uh, the consensus is that's about 50 to 60% of the risk picture for substance abuse. Epigenetics is it's fascinating and it's an emerging field and that has to do epigenetics means above the genes and that means that the things that we experience in our environment, the trauma, the adverse childhood experiences, actually both the positive and negative things that we experience in our environment affect the way our genes express themselves in our body. So we're not actually changing the genes themselves, we're just changing the way the genes express. And there are a bunch of things that are now appear to be based in epigenetics and substance abuse is one of them. So for example, if you have a kid who, um, maybe has a, predisp a genetic predisposition for substance abuse, but lives in a really, really stressful environment where the kids, it actually can make the, some genes turn on and some other genes turn off and it really affects the way that the genes work in the body. Um, so that's a p piece of the picture. And then the environment piece comes down to things like, like I mentioned, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, all kinds of other risks that uh, factor in, you know, early academic failure. Um, also, all those sorts of things can make it so that that risk, uh, I like to think of it as a, a old timey scales of justice. So like on one side, you have risk on the other side, you have prevention and the risk factors, the more risk factors you have for substance abuse, the heavier that risk side is going to be. And so you want as much prevention heaped on there as possible to outweigh the risk. And so all three of those things, you know, sort of deserve their own little sections of the book because they all have a different part to play. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I love that analogy of the scale. And I want to get to that in a second, because we can get a little more practical in talking about what to put on the scale. Um, mm -hmm. But first, you mentioned ACEs, Adverse mm -hmm. Childhood Experiences, which I think is fascinating. For people who don't know about ACEs, can you just kind of tell us what, sure. what is that all about? Sure. So some physicians noticed that, wow, you know, the things that kids go through as a child seem to have some sort of impact on their adult health. Fascinating. So <laughs> they decided at uh, Kaiser Permanente and the CDC did this massive study um, survey where essentially they surveyed people retrospectively about what they had experienced in their childhood and then looked at their adult health. And it turns out that there's this uh, certain adverse childhood experiences um, and it, if you want to know what your um, what they call an ACE score, your adverse childhood experiences score, it's on a scale of one to 10. You can just Google CDC ACE quiz and it'll come up. And uh, so for kids 
the, for example, the kids in my classroom tended to have really high scores. The higher your score, the higher your risk for all kinds of negative mental health and physical health outcomes are. And I'm talking about like stroke and heart attacks and all kinds of things. Um, there's a wonderful book by Nadine Burke Harris called The Deepest Well that does a beautiful job of explaining ACEs. And in addition to the ACEs that the CDC outlines, she talks about all sorts of other sort of secondary ACEs that she also understands to play a part in um, in kids the in predicting sort of who will have good outcomes and who will have poor outcomes. So those are ACEs um, and they tend to be things that are based in the household. Like for example, if you have someone in the household with substance abuse, if you have, um, if you lose a parent, if you have a uh, violence in the house, if you have, you know, a, a parent who's incarcerated, those sorts of things, violence in the community, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about when we talk about adverse childhood experiences. Mm, so interesting. And you mentioned Nadine Burke Harris, who's a pediatrician and now the Surgeon General mm -hmm. of California. Um, Her book and is I think great. Well, you know what? I read about it in your book and I quickly went over and added it to my to, to be read pile. <laughs> yes. It's a it's an essential read. It's really good. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that and hopefully can share more about that down the road on the show. Um, and I think she's the one who added death of a caregiver to the to the list, which for my listeners here um, is, of course, really relevant. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, by yep. definition, probably almost everybody listening to this has had the death of the child's other parent. Right. Um, and it's can and some of these things, you know, get really dicey because one on on the one hand, divorce and separation is, you know, one of the risk factors for substance abuse. And yet, you know, 50% of marriages end in divorce. And so one of the things I try to preface that discussion with by with is the idea that I am not looking at if you read the book, you'll understand number one that shame and um, shame and secrets. I just I'm I hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. I hate the idea that someone would feel so ashamed of their substance abuse problem that they couldn't talk about it. So from my perspective, the thing I don't want to do is to get is to come to parents and say, "Look, you're divorced. Therefore, your kid's risk is really, really high, and you need to do all these things." What I'm looking to do is to say, "Look, if we look at what our kids' risk factors are for substance abuse, then we have." Have power, right? Because that information is power. If we know these things, then we can attack those risk factors, heap the sub the prevention on in a very uh, in a very specific way, so that we can counter those specific risks. So the last thing I want to do is make parents feel like, oh my gosh, I now have to do one more thing. What I want parents to do is to say, look, okay, just now that I know this information, that gives me some power to help prevent, um, to help um, eliminate, not eliminate, but help, to help outweigh that risk um, with yeah. more prevention. Yeah. Love it. Okay, good. Thank you for, for elaborating on that. Um, okay, so outweighing the risk with prevention. So you right. talked about a scale. So now listeners can't see I'm waving, I'm balancing my hands <laughs> up and down here, right? And so I think you're talking about that old fashioned scale that we probably yeah. haven't ever seen in like a bazillion years, but where like Scales one side and justice, the other. <laughs> you know, the one that she's, she's holding in the, yeah. Yes, where you can put things on one side and things on the other side yeah. and see if they balance out. We Maybe we use right. those in high school chem class or something way long ago. Right. Uh, right. Okay. So those are the scales we're talking about. All right. So I think what you're telling us is that um, any particular individual has certain risk factors on one side of the mm -hmm. scale, and that might be based on genetics, that might be based right. on epigenetics, that might be based right. on environment. And I think what you're suggesting is we need to balance that off on the other side of the scale. Right. So for example, I was born to, I had a parent who was an alcoholic. I um, was born with the genetics from a long line of uh, people who were alcoholics and substance abusers. So I, that's in my family tree. Um, I, you know, that I can't do anything about, right? But so I'm born with that risk. And then, so my children are also at elevated risk. So from my perspective, knowing that is really, really important because that affects how I talk to them about it. When I'm not, you know, that's going to be a very important part of the discussion that I have with them when I'm talking to them about drugs and alcohol. Look, you are at higher risk for substance abuse. So let's talk about not just using drugs and alcohol, but what drug, what it looks like when drugs and alcohol that use starts to slide into abuse. What does that look like? What might it feel like? Those kind of conversations are really important because 
there's this great saying in, in recovery in 12 step recovery that it's never, that using is never as much fun after you've been through some recovery because you have the information in your head that sort of harshes your buzz. Right. So like, if I were to go back out there and relapse and start drinking, I've got all this unfortunate information in my head (laughs) about what I'm doing to myself, what's happening, all that stuff about, you know, even the excuses I make to myself and how my brain concocts these crazy excuses about my drinking in order to justify it. So I feel like the more I information my kids have about that might make them think, oh, wait, this is one of those things we talked about where maybe I'm looking forward to drinking this weekend a little bit too much, that kind of thing, then that at least is a seed planted. And that seed planted is going to be really important um, to if they do have a problem later on, God forbid, that that might be one of those things that sort of haunts them later on or causes them to say, oh, you know, I think this is getting out of control Uh, because, and I hate that I use the metaphor of seeds because what I usually use is the metaphor of pieces of the puzzle that all of these, let's say the puzzle is a 100 piece puzzle the, it's going to take all 100 of those pieces before sort of things click into place um, later on down the line. Well, let's say you have a friend who you think might have a problem. It's hardly ever going to be that first person that sort of makes your friend say, oh, I should get help now. Let's go do that now. But you can't get to that last piece without all the other pieces being in place. So in a way for me, this prevention stuff is not just about preventing them from their first use, which is important. It's also about giving them some tools to help them later on if their use starts to become something that's unhealthy. So Mm. it's a, there's a multi multifaceted approach here as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, You were talking about how, yeah, having information and how helpful having information mm-hmm. is. And one of the things that that was really interesting in the book, you have a lot of information about the, the teenage brain and mm-hmm. um, the development of the teenage brain. And you pointed out something that I had never thought of, which is that everybody knows, you know, like, you know, if a, if a baby is in utero that like, you know, the pregnant mother shouldn't drink because of the, it's going to affect their brain development mm-hmm. and things like that. And that is a time of massive brain development. Mm-hmm. But that this that that in the first you know year or two of life, but that the next massive time of brain development starts around puberty and through the teenage yeah. years. Yeah. So there are two periods of what we call plasticity, ma- massive restructuring, change, and growth that happens in the brain. The first is from obviously when the, the baby is developing in utero, but also from um, zero to age two. That period of that's just a massive, massive period of growth. And the only other one that even gets close is puberty to early 20s, right? And we, uh, the experts say there is no safe level of alcohol consumption during pregnancy. And one would assume that they're probably, and, you know, given that we're, people are advised to leave some time between consuming like a glass of wine and breastfeeding, um, one would assume there probably is not a safe level of alcohol in infants. That's not really something we can test very easily. (laughs) So given that there have been some people that have come out and said, given that there is no safe amount of alcohol during pregnancy and early in um, infancy, then why do we think that there is a safe level of alcohol during adolescence? And also I want to make it another thing really clear which is that there's a a whole bunch of new books coming out right now and that just came out and are coming out about safe drug and alcohol use uh, among adults. You know, for example, Dr. Carl Hart has a new book. He had written one called High Price, but there's a new book coming out called Drug Use for Grownups. Uh, Michael Pollan wrote about psychedelic use among adults. And they're having all these conversations about how low the risk is for some of these drugs and blah, blah, blah. And I actually agree with many of their points, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about adult brains. We're talking about children's brains. We're talking about adolescent brains. And adolescent brains are not finished developing until the early to mid 20s. And in the meantime, the things that the substances that we put in our body and the things in our environment have an incredible, a a huge effect on the development of the brain. And there's no going back. Once that door shuts in the, at the end of the early 20s, it's not like you can go back and do any remedial <laughs> synaptogenesis or remedial myelination or anything like that. And if stuff doesn't happen in the proper order during adolescence, you can have permanent, um, you know, 
I'm not going to say damage. I'm going to say permanent losses, permanent uh, gaps in development that can, are really, really um, can be really detrimental to short-term memory function, to learning, the ability to learn, the ability to, you know, there's all kinds of things that alcohol and drugs can actually mess with in adolescence that really don't pose as much of a risk once you're an adult. Hmm. That is so interesting. I wonder if, I mean, is that something that's worth, you know, trying to talk to our kids about, like about their mm -hmm. brain development oh, structure and the connections absolutely. being made and all that? Absolutely. That, yeah. In fact, um, so when I'm out speaking about um, gift of failure stuff and doing professional development for teachers, we talk a lot about how important it is to be talking to kids from a very young age about their the difference between their lower brain and sort of their amygdala and their like, Johnny was mean to me, so I punched him because that's, you know, your amygdala handles sort of that emotional response. And then the upper part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that sort of area right between sort of behind your forehead, that area doesn't hook up fully until it's not done hook being hooked up until the early to mid 20s. And so have giving kids conversations, giving kids information about how their brain works and the difference between the higher thinking and the lower sort of emotional limbic system thinking, that's useful to kids and empowering empowers kids to take control over their, um, their emotions and their reactions and gives them the opportunity to sort of take a minute and engage their upper brain as opposed to their lower brain in the same way, having, giving kids information about the way, for example, the way cannabis messes with the hippocampus is really, really important because if you, one of the things we know works for prevention is giving kids information and giving them a bit of credit about making good decisions based on balanced information. And that information comes from the data we have from sticking people in fMRI tubes and looking at their brains, you know, before use, during use, after use, and looking at how um, users' brains are different from non-users' brains and that kind of thing. So part of prevention always is going to be a from my perspective anyway, is going to be transparency. Actually, not from my, I don't know why I said that. We know that the evidence-based prevention programs that work well are all about giving kids information, arming them with the information they need, including, you know, refusal skills, including all kinds of information about their brains and how they work. Um, it not only works great for learning. I mean, all you have to do is read Carol Dweck's mindset and find out that in order to find out that when kids understand that intelligence is malleable instead of fixed, that they tend to have a, um, they tend to stretch themselves more and try more challenge problems and understand that the harder they work and the more they stretch their brains that and make more connections in their brains, the more potential they have to become more intelligent. Um, in Along those same lines, when we tell kids inf really true information about what drugs and alcohol do in their adolescent brains, that gives them just one more reason that they might say, you know, eh, not tonight. I think I'll maybe some other time, but not today. And that's, that's power. That's giving kids power as opposed to trying to force them to do something based on our will without a lot of, you know, with that, just because I said so kind of idea doesn't tend to work with kids. Um, mm. Lecturing doesn't work. Scare tactics don't work. What does work is giving them information. Well, and so that that latter part you mentioned reminds me, I think many of us, you and I are in the right age group, and probably many of my listeners who grew up with the, the, the Nancy Reagan just say no approach to drug and alcohol use and abuse. And it sounds like you're yeah. saying that's not the way to go. No, 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 that does not work. And not only does that not work, the scared straight programs don't work. Um, um, credit to the D.A.R.E. program. D.A.R.E. actually did revamp their program um, once we realized they started looking at the efficacy of that program. In the early versions of D.A.R.E., kids were actually more likely to try drugs and alcohol after having gone through the, uh, the initial, the early D.A.R.E. programs because they weren't based on any science or the science of prevention, what they were based on was law enforcement um, objectives. So hmm. that that program was created by the uh, Los Angeles Police Department. And it was with all great intentions. It just wasn't based on prevention science that actually works. And we now know what works because we have uh, we have the ability to objectively um, evaluate programs and look to see what happens in those in those programs with the kids that have graduated from those programs. And so that's why the chapter on uh, school based uh, prevention programs focuses so much on the evidence based programs as opposed to and here's what's shocking. 57% of schools in this country 
have the only 57% of schools in this country have any kind of substance abuse prevention program in them. Hmm. And of that 57%, only 10% of them are evidence-based. So we can do so much better in schools. And the great news is that the programs that work the best are already sort of partially in place in schools because at the heart of really great substance abuse prevention programs are great social emotional learning programs. And social emotional learning programs are all the rage right now. So if we just latch on to those, I think we'll we'll be doing we'll be doing pretty well. Huh. Okay. So wait, but let me see. I think you just said 40 or so percent of the schools in this country aren't doing anything on this topic. And then like, only, yeah, yeah. And then like 90% yeah. aren't doing the right things. Right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So if parents are sitting here yeah. thinking, um, well, I'm sure my kid's getting this stuff in school. I don't need to worry too They're much about not. these. Okay. All right. Well, that's yeah. an important. Well, I think. But, and and the problem is, is that when I say any substance abuse prevention program, some of them are like, oh, we'll bring in, you know, this guy, and like in the story of Georgia, in the book, um, you know, she talked about the fact that when she was in middle school, the substance abuse prevention program was bringing in some old guy to talk about what his years as an alcoholic were like, and that not only doesn't work, it really backfired in Georgia's, um, in Georgia's case, because she didn't have any of the evidence information to go around with it. All she heard was this guy said, I had a lot of problems and alcohol numbed them. And she's like, ah, okay. Uh. I have severe anxiety. That's debilitating. Of course, you know, she was in middle school. So who knows what word she used to herself, but she was like, Bingo, numbing. That's what I need. And then alcohol became her drug of choice for a very long time. She was a daily drinker by the time I met her and I met, I started teaching her in high school. So, um, and it worked really, you know, the thing is, is in the short term, some of these things work really well, which is what's so tricky about them. A lot of kids are, um, you know, medicating their pain and some of drugs, alcohol work great for that. It's just the long-term problems and the damage they do to their brains that are unfortunate buzzkills on that end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Um, <clears throat> so if we can't count on the fact that school is taking care of this topic for us, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the conversations we should be having in our homes, maybe kind of by different ages, like when should we start? And then mm -hmm. what should we be saying to different age groups of our kids? So um, really good programs start all the way back in preschool, all the way back in wow. preschool, talking preschool. about things like, yes, but we're not talking about like, you know, crack use in preschool. What we're talking about in preschool is why we wash our hands, why we don't swallow the toothpaste, why we spit it out in the sink, um, why mommy's name is on that prescription label and not daddy's name or not my other mommy's name or not my sister's name because that prescription is for mommy. And why do you think that we don't take prescriptions that are for other people? You know, those kind of conversations start really, really young. And they're part of a big, greater sort of general health and what we put in our bodies, nutrition, chemicals. You know, if you talk about, talk to your kids about, you know, cleaning chemicals and, you know, Tide Pods and why we don't eat those, that's all part of the same conversation about harmful chemicals, right? Hmm. So then as you move up through elementary school, and the elementary school, you start talking about vaping and tobacco and nicotine and all of these sort of things. And naturally, a lot of those conversations can happen. Luckily, not as naturally now, because it was funny. My kids mentioned recently that they couldn't remember the last time they've seen anyone smoke because I live in Vermont. The rates of smoking are so low here. Um, people just I never see people smoke cigarettes, but if you're around people who vape or people who smoke cigarettes, then those conversations can happen really naturally. You're at Thanksgiving and Uncle Tommy has to go out on the front porch to smoke his cigarette. And you say, why do you think Uncle Tommy has to go out on the front porch? What's he doing out there? Oh, it's because, you know, grandma knows he's not, he's not allowed to, to um, smoke in the house because grandma knows that that um, the smoke that he would release inside the house is not good for us, which of course leads to a conversation about why is Uncle Tommy putting that smoke in his body? And that's an interesting conversation too. Then it gets kind of tricky too, because you're talking, a lot of people don't want to talk about that stuff because they don't want to seem as if they're passing judgment on other people. But part of being 
honest and transparent with kids about information is talking about the fact that yes, tobacco and, and cigarette smoke and vaping can be harmful to the body. And when kids see someone else drink too much, you know, also can happen around, you know, holidays and things like that, family gatherings, maybe even in their own home, having conversations about what's actually happening is really, really important. Because as a kid who knew instinctively what was happening and sort of figured it out as I went along and then was told, no, no, that's not what you're perceiving. That's not what's happening at all. Uh, that your parent is just tired or doesn't feel well and is taking a nap. Those sorts of, you know, not giving kids correct information about what they are perceiving is real. That's gaslighting. And it's really emotionally devastating for kids. And given that kids as young kids who live in a household where they have a parent who is an alcoholic, those kids as young as four can differentiate between alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. It's mm -hmm. not like you're telling them something they don't already know. Having conversations, very candid conversations about what it means to use substances, especially if it's something they're exposed to, is going to be really, really important. As you move up, you know, you graduate from conversations around vaping and around the fact that, you know, kids, it's not harmless and that kids who, who vape are going to be more likely to move on to tobacco cigarettes and all the different forms of vaping and stuff like that. And then you move directly into conversations about, you know, alcohol, beer and wine and the things that people tend to start with and, and continue in a developmentally appropriate way to talk about those substances. And as the kids get older, you're talking about more refusal skills. You know, what would you do if someone came up and offered you drugs or alcohol? What are some ways that you could, um, I talked to my kids a lot about exit strategies. So I have to have an exit strategy whenever I go to a party or a dinner thing, just in case I were to feel uncomfortable, like, or start to feel like I wanted to drink or started to feel just uncomfortable with the amount of drinking or whatever that thing is. So my husband and I have sort of a signal we send each other. And I actually talk with my kids about what are some possible excuses you can use if you are at a party and everyone else is drinking and you don't want to. If you don't want to leave that party, what are some possible things you can do? So I actually give kids scripts for things they can say. Um, and there's lots of different things they can say beyond, I just don't want to drink. There's all kinds of excuses you can make that have to do with, I'm taking a medication, I'm allergic, you know, all kinds of other things that you can, you can do. For a while there, my, my older son actually threw me under the bus. He, he didn't drink. He claims he used my, um, you know, that sort of genetic predisposition thing as one of his excuses to not drink when he was younger. So anyway, that's yeah. uh, that sort of it's it, what matters is that it's a developmentally appropriate conversation around health and the things we put in our body. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and I love that you give examples in the book. And so I encourage people to look those up. You had a number of different scripts and you know, suggestions mm -hmm. of excuses that kids can use and get into the really nuts and bolts, you know, like how can you really you know, scenario role play or whatever, um, yeah. to give your kids some tools to, to, uh, to deal it with the situation until, in the moment. It wasn't until I got out on the road speaking about gift to failure that I realized just how granular some parents wanted me to get in my yeah. advice. And so yeah. we went, we went there with this yeah. book. We gave very granular advice. Yeah. Very Which is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. And, and speaking of granular and can you give us a realistic idea? I mean, just how early are kids starting to experiment with various substances today? Some people might be listening to this and they, mm -hmm. oh, my kid's too young, right? right? Like, what, what are we looking at here? So what's really cool is there's a, a report that comes out once a year. It's called the Monitoring the Future Report. It's done by the University of Michigan. And it's a huge survey of kids' attitudes and habits around um, all kinds of risky behaviors, but substances are clearly in there. And they look, they talk to eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. And so we know, for example, that 24% uh, of eighth graders admit to have having had at least a sip of alcohol by the time they finish eighth grade. So, and we know that among kids who do start substances, that the time that they tend to start using is in middle school. So that's why I say, if we're waiting to talk to kids in, uh, you know, if we're waiting till middle school to start talking about kids, we we're really uh, behind them as they have already, the bus has already left the depot, so to speak. So it's a really, really important that we start earlier than that. Um, 
And then, you know, you can, the cool thing about monitoring the future is obviously as the years go by, that's how we know that use has gone down um, over the past decade. That's how we know it sort of leveled out pre-pandemic. Um, it was, it's a little worrisome that that leveling happened pre-pandemic and there's, you know, vaping is up, but everything else has been down. Um, what's really fascinating to me is that with all the talk, uh, with the legalization of, of marijuana and, and psilocybin in Colorado and, um, you know, Michael Pollan's book about, um, about psychedelics, um, the one category among actually all comers, all people of all ages, um, in adults, uh, uh, psychedelic and um, cannabis use is up. <laughs> but everything yeah. else, for the most part, except for vaping, is down. But among adults, there are some people going back and trying it out and saying, oh, I never did that in college, or I want to revisit my childhood kind of thing. So there is uh, use going up among adults, which is interesting to me. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but again, lo a lot less risk for the adults. A lot of things that are locked down in the brain at that point and just not as susceptible to damage as, as they are in the adolescent brain. Well, so that actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. It reminds me, I pulled out a, a statistic that you mentioned in the book here. Kids who start drinking in middle school have a lifetime risk of substance use dependence of 41%. However, mm -hmm. if they wait until they're 18, it falls to 17%. If they wait yeah. until 21, it falls to 11%. Yeah. Yeah. So for any statisticians listening out there, anyone who has any experience with statistics, you know that there are some confounders in there, right? Because kids who try drugs younger probably have more access, probably come from a family where it's more permissive, possibly a family where the genetic risk is higher because that's because there are probably, you know, maybe there are people with uh, drug and alcohol problems in the home. So there are some confounders with that data, but I, you know that's fairly startling to me. We know that among people who have substance use disorders in their adult life, nine out of 10 of them started before they were 18. So mm. the younger the use, the higher the risk of a substance use disorder during their lifetime. So that's why this big message of delay, delay, delay is so important. And we have to just get over some of the myths we have um, going on and circulating in our culture. You know that sort of European romantic myth of, oh, you know, I want to raise my kid like the Europeans, moderate drinkers, where, you know, they can, little kids can have a glass of wine at the table and isn't that cute and blah, blah, blah. The problem is, A, it's not true. Obviously, if kids, um, the kids of what's called permissive parents, parents that have, um, allow kids sips when they're young, those kids are more likely to have substance use disorder during their lifetime. And by the way, Europe has the highest level of alcoholism in the world. So hmm. modeling ourselves as after an area of the world that um, we romanticize for their alcohol intake and or practices might not be the best idea. Um, even France has had to pull back and say their health, you know, their health systems over there have had to say, look, the amount of alcohol that we've been saying is, you know, sort of, oh, you know, a, a, an okay amount of use during the week, maybe that's too much. And they've recently scaled back their numbers and said we and have reduced the number of glasses of wine per week that's actually appropriate and healthy. So, you know, and then we have, you know, Holly Whitaker's new book called Quit Like a Woman where she talks about the fact that, you know, having to score high enough on a, an, an am I an alcoholic test and making that be a barometer of whether or not you start to look at your drinking with a critical eye, maybe that's not a great idea. Maybe we should be thinking about whether or not our use is affecting our life. And, and the fact that, you know, as alcohol breaks down in the body, there are some chemicals in there that are really, really toxic chemicals. And so maybe it's not about the fact that 10% of us can't handle our booze. Maybe it's about the fact that for everyone, maybe booze isn't the healthiest thing, or at least at levels that we've sort of put out there in the past. So anyway, there's mm. a lot of reasons that um, this is a really great time to be thinking about taking a month off, like sober January, dry January is a thing. Sober October is a thing. Um, and I, th and they're more increasingly popular. And, mm. you know, I'm happy to report that in, even various beer companies are starting to figure that, uh, that out and are making some actually really tasty craft non-alcoholic beers. I did an article on those for the Washington Post a couple years ago. There are, um, 
even the retail industry started the alcohol industry starting to figure out that it might be profitable to offer some non-alcoholic uh, options. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the practical <clears throat> point about, um, you know, whether, whether or not allowing sipping from a young age is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And the other thing along that line I was thinking about, um, and just a really practical question at some point, probably your kids are going to ask the parent, right? Right. What was, you know, did you drink mm -hmm. in high school or in college or underage or, you know, ask about mm -hmm. your prior and youthful substance use? How do you have some tips for parents? Like, what do you say? How do you not mess up that conversation? What's the right way to, to approach that? Um, so this is, this is something I talked about with a lot of experts because this is a dicey one. And it's always so interesting to me, like they have their advice and then they have like, and let me, t and now off the record, let me tell you how I screwed this up. It's always uh. fascinating. Um, one, uh, person I decided I, I didn't name in the book talked about the fact that his son actually come, came to him in his twenties and said, dad, um, the way you handled that with me may not have been the best idea because you made it sound really fun. Like you tried a little of this you, and you wanted to be like, cool guy. Yeah, I'm the cool guy. And let me tell you about the stuff that I tried. Um, I, from my, from the perspective for, of that, I, the conclusions I made after talking to lots of people about this is I'm always going to come at it from an, the angle of honesty. So my kids are very aware of what I went through. They are, they've, you know, Clearly now it's in a book anyway. <laughs> so, and some of that came as news to my husband, frankly, you know, showing my husband the book once it was done was really frightening because I was very good at hiding it. Um, we talked to them about their grandparents' use, um, the grandparents that have issues. We talked to them about my husband's use. So my husband is even though he has the genetics um, and he's got, you know, he came fully loaded with genetics to have a problem, but he doesn't, he is a normal drinker. He, you know, and in the year after he graduated from college, he's fully willing to admit he smoked a lot of pot because some house, uh, some of the members of his household when he was living in sort of a, you know, lots of people living in the same house grew it in the house. And he is very clear on the fact that he could absolutely tell a difference in his short term memory pre that year and post that year. And huh. in a very, you know, and he talks about the fact that the reason that he smoked a lot of pot that year is that he was really feeling kind of lost. He didn't know what he was going to do. He wasn't happy with himself. And that was filling a hole for him, but not in a healthy way, rather than sort of getting a grip and going and searching out other things to do and other alternatives. He was just medicating the sense of ennui that he had over his life. And these are very real conversations that we've had with our kids. And, um, you know, that's sort of where I stand on the whole honesty versus dishonesty about it and not romanticizing it. I mean, you're not trying to talk it up as a practice to your kids. You, you know, I would, I would sort of defer to the whole, you know, here's what happened and here's how I think it affected me. Mm. And admitting to the real reasons that we do it. I mean, I, I've suffered with anxiety my whole life. And that was a big place that the, the big thing that I was medicating with was drinking. And unfortunately, over the long term, alcohol exacerbates uh, anxiety. But in the short term, you know, it helped me a little. It helped me get outside of my own head. Um, but most drugs and alcohol that ha that provide a short term solution over the long term tend to exacerbate whatever problem there you're trying to address. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that, and and thank you also for sharing the memoir aspect in your book. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's I think it's important for people to. Um, understand other people's journeys and think about what we do and don't see in ourselves or in our loved ones in different examples, not only yours, but the other people you shared in the book, their stories. Um, we might, or we might not see some of our kids in, in the, in the teenagers you shared in the book. Um, and can think about, you know, what maybe does or doesn't apply to our own family mm -hmm. situation. I think the thing for me that's really been rewarding is every single time I go up on stage and I talk about the fact that I'm in recovery, I always get an email from someone after the fact, someone who's concerned about themselves or someone else, but most often about themselves. And it's been interesting during the pandemic, I've kept all of, I keep all of those emails in sort of a separate folder on my computer. And every once in a while, I just, just say, Hey, checking in, how you doing? One 
you know, one person to another. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, it's been really scary because some of those people go dark. And I know that, you know, people who would normally reply are, are not replying. And that's really terrifying. But I've been in recovery long enough that, you know, I've lost people that I love. And I understand, um, you know, what happens when people go back out there and start using again. But the more transparent I am about my story, the more it encourages other people to be transparent about theirs. And I know for a fact that in terms of the negative consequences of being a child of an alcoholic, the lying and the gaslighting and the shame um, were, are the things that have stuck with me longest. They're still the things that make me the angriest, um, uh, you know, because when kids, when we gaslight kids, we really do a lot of emotional damage when we tell them, no, 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 what you, what you think you're perceiving is not what you're perceiving. That's, that's a really damaging thing to do to a kid. And that's, I want to avoid that for as many, I want as many kids to not have to grow up that way as yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we wind up here, speaking of what you just mentioned, something that, that reminded me, um, if, if someone is listening to this, I know the main point of this discussion is about, you know, inoculating our kids against the risk. But um, if someone's listening and, and maybe is concerned about their own substance use or the use of a loved one or one of their kids or somebody else, mm -hmm. is there something you could point them to that they could, you know, call or Google right now to, to maybe start mm -hmm. looking yeah. for something? Yeah, there's, um, so my favorite place to send people to is SAMHSA.gov. It's S A M. H S A. And um, the reason I like SAMHSA.gov is that it's not just about substance abuse. It's about mental health services in general. And so there's, because so many mental health, uh, mental health disorders are very high risk factors for substance abuse, those two things that's called being, having a dual diagnosis, those two things really go hand in hand. And so SAMHSA.gov is a fantastic resource for all kinds of mental health resources, including substance abuse. So okay. SAMHSA.gov, S-A-M-H-S-A. -S okay, terrific. Well, thank you for that. And I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well. Um, okay, good. Well, you know what? I think we're just about out of time here. So just one last question to wrap us up. Yeah, what's, of course. What's the bottom line message for parents in your book? What are you hoping they take away from it? One, the one bottom line message for, for me anyway is, and the one that I sort of talk to my kids about all the time is, is the delay, delay, delay. And mainly, you know, mainly that comes down to the fact that I just keep repeating to them how much their risk factors for all kinds of negative outcomes go down with each passing year that they're not using substances, whether that's their brains are able to continue developing, um, their executive function can can be stronger because their their uh, uh, frontal lobe is having time to come online and having, you know, freedom from one of the big things that's happening in adolescence is uh, the brain is trying to self is trying to regulate all the time and create like a a line where it's sort of things are normalized in the brain and the act and you know, all between hormones and neurotransmitters, the adolescent brain is up and down and up and down and up and down. And then you add substances to that and it really throws the whole system off, off of whack out of whack. And it makes it so that it's even more difficult for the brain to do the things it needs to do in order to develop normally to make it so the kids have the most potential to be as, um, as intelligent, as creative, as wonderful as they can possibly be in their adult lives. And so that delay, it's delay, delay, delay is a little bit to me, like one day at a time that, you know, I, if I'm feeling bad on a particular day and I feel like I'm tempted to use, I always have to just remember that I just have to not drink today. And I use a really similar sort of idea when I'm thinking about my kids, like with each passing day, your brain is getting stronger and stronger. So just not today is another sort of easy to bite off sort of way to think about it. But yeah, that delay thing is, is super important. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a great place to end. So great. my guest today is Jessica Leahy, author of The Addiction Inoculation and also The Gift of Failure. So Jess, where can listeners find you and find your books if they'd like to learn more about your work? Uh, everything is over at jessicaleahy.com. And in terms of social media, I tend to hang out over on Twitter because that's where all the teachers are. Um, as in, uh, as a profession, educators are some of the biggest users of Twitter. So I'm over there at, at Jess Leahy and I'm on Instagram at, at Teacher Leahy. Okay, terrific. Well, Jess, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much. 
I hope you enjoyed my interview with Jessica Leahy as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 98. And a big shout out today to all my listeners in Vermont in honor of today's guest. And if you're in Vermont, I'd love to hear from you and especially about any resources in your area there that I can help share and help spread the word about. And speaking of resources, a few resources for everyone this week. Um, First of all, on the most recent episode of the Ask Lisa podcast, it's episode 34, and this is Dr. Lisa Damore's podcast on parenting in general, not grief specific. This week, she interviews Julie Lithcott Hames, who is the author of the brand new book out this week, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. And it's a follow on to her earlier best-selling book, How to Raise an Adult. So this one is for young adults. Um, So anyway, check out that podcast episode 34 on Lisa Damore's podcast called Ask Lisa. Um, I I think anytime you get these two um, parenting powerhouses together on the same show, it's worth having a listen. And then secondly, um, a heads up that Art with Heart is having a sale right now through April 15th. And if you haven't heard of Art with Heart, it's a... uh, art-based therapeutic activity books for kids and teens. They have different books for different ages. Um, And so they have some terrific resources, and their website is artwithheart.org, and the code for the sale right now is CREATE30. So check that out. And one more thing. I read an interesting article yesterday. Um, It's an article in the Washington Post. I'm going to link to it in the blog post in the email because I'm not sure how to describe it here. Um, But there's going to be a new program starting April 12th, and this is just for U.S. listeners. But FEMA is going to be starting a new program for funeral expense reimbursement for families of COVID victims. Um, It looks like they set up a hotline that's going to be... um, start taking calls on April 12th, and this article in the Washington Post talks a little bit about the program and how to call that hotline and how to get more information. So when I do get more information um, in the future, maybe a website or something, I'll share that again. But in the meantime, if this is applicable to you or maybe someone you know that you could send it on to, um, that might be helpful. And speaking of links, I always put these links in this week's email and also this week's blog post on my website. So if you miss a link here, you can you can go over to my blog at jennylisk.com and look for blog and find this uh, this week's post. But um, more directly, make sure you're on my email list so you get these directly in your email each week. Okay, and once again, please remember to rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts so that more widowed parents can find it. And as always, thank you for listening, and until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.